user. Um, <clears throat> since we have fairly narrow peaks at specific frequencies, we can adopt some of the, the notation from electromagnetics, and these electromagnetics guys talk about resonators or filters or things like that that have a Q, the Q of a filter, a bandpass filter, or something you might have learned in some of your electronics classes. And if the electromagnetic guys or the electronics guys get a Q of a couple hundred, uh, they're real happy. But us optics guys think that they're a bunch of wankers because the, few, the Q of a good optical cavity is something of the order of 100 million, which is orders of magnitude more than you would get for an electronic or electromagnetic cavity. Uh, because these Q values for a, a very resonant cavity have, have values of 10 to the 8th, we typically define another term and this is given in your book called the finesse, that has values on the orders of hundreds because the numbers are just a little bit easier to work with. And again, the Q is defined by the width of one of these longitudinal modes divided by the center frequency nu naught, or if you prefer to work in wavelength, which I like to do, the change in wavelength delta lambda divided by the center wavelength lambda naught, and these are equivalent definitions. Now, it turns out there is another way to think about the light in the cavity that I think is a little bit more intuitive, that makes a little bit more sense, and this is the photon lifetime. And if you think of a cavity, so let's draw some mirrors here, and you think of a photon in this cavity, it's going to bounce here, and the chances are that it's not going to make it through the mirror because the transmission is very small, the reflection is high, so the probability is it's going to bounce this way and keep bouncing back and forth, but eventually, uh, it's going to beat the odds of probability and get order to it and, and be able to escape. And the, the number of bounces, and since it's trapped with mirrors, this is the point, how long it effectively takes to get trapped in that cavity is the photon lifetime, tau sub p. And to me, I like that intuitive picture because it really lets me think of photons being trapped in the cavity. And the photon lifetime in the cavity has a very familiar form. Um, the, the number of photons is a function of time, n sub t if we inject a bunch of photons at time t equals zero right here, um, are going to decay exponentially with something that looks very much like a, an RC time constant. And in fact, uh, the photon lifetime tau sub p serves the same thing and is given by the round trip time divided by r1, r2. And what you see here is you increase the reflectivity, the photon lifetime increases, which means for high reflectivity mirrors, our curve is going to look like this. Well, on the other hand, for low reflectivity mirrors, uh, we're going to have a much shorter lifetime. And in fact, we can see that because one of the applets um, that is available to you, if I can go ahead and call my applet caller here, um, in fact, does illustrate this. So let's go ahead and scroll down. Um, <clears throat> if I start this, I'm going to start to see a pulse right here moving through the cavity. I apologize for the slowness of this, but I didn't program it. You see some light escapes by having a mirror. The reflectivity of that mirror is 0.8, while the back mirror reflectivity is 1, and you'll see light escape even though it's not supposed to. And as this bounces back and forth, there's a 20% a probability the photons escape through the front mirror each time, and you can see that, in fact, you do get an exponential curve as the thing bounces back and forth. Of course, in reality, except in very special lasers we'll cover at the end of the course, um, you don't create pulses of light. You can think of all kinds of individual photons going back and forth, and this would, treatment would apply for one photon, but the, the laser is putting out light continuously. Certainly, if we decrease the reflectivity of the mirrors a little bit by doing those sliders and start it, we expect to see a much faster decay because the light escapes much more quickly. There's a much higher probability it gets away, and you can see, in fact, that what you're going to have is a curve that, that has a much longer or a much shorter time constant, if you're thinking of RTC time constants with the photon lifetime being a time constant, and so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and go back and go to the slideshow. Um, and it may occur to you that essentially what you've got, let's go back and get a red pen, is that since you've got some kind of time constant, Faster decays would give you more frequencies. We know that from the uncertainty principle, while slower decays would give you less frequencies because it takes less frequency to make a slowly changing thing than it does a fast thing through the whole Fourier formalism. And it turns out that, as you would expect, the line width and the photon lifetime, the delta nu up here and the tau down here, are in fact related. 
through something that looks suspiciously like an uncertainty principle. And that is not at all an accident. In fact, if you have a cavity in which photons can escape very quickly, delta nu tends to be very broad because you have low R. If, on the other hand, you have a cavity um, that has very high reflectivity, you get very sharp, peakety structures that look like this because the photons escape very slowly and they're trapped for a long time. And as I said from the previous slide, you can, you can calculate this numerically. There's one other thing we need to do before we wrap up this mini-lecture, and that's to look at what happens in a cavity and we have gain. Uh, we know that if we increase the reflectivity, uh, we can calculate the transmission as a function of frequency by summing up all the rays. We talked about that before. And as the reflectivity gets higher, the line width increases because the cavities are trapped longer. Um, certainly, you would expect that if you increased the gain and gave some amplification to regenerate the photons, that the, the line width might also decrease. And in fact, that's what you do see. So we add some gain into the cavity. And don't worry if you don't understand gain. Just think of it as an ampli amplification for light, just like the gain of an amplifier. And we'll learn this in a lot of detail later. But essentially what happens is, is we start to increase the reflectivity from 0.97 to 0.99 you see these peaks sharpen up a little bit. And even from 0.95 with a gain of 1 or no gain at all, um, they're getting sharper. As we start to add gain, notice the peaks get higher and higher and higher and narrower and narrower and narrower. And this is actually very interesting because it says, theoretically, in a laser, you can get very, very narrow ranges of frequency. And it turns out that if you really want to measure frequency, to the highest accuracy that is humanly possible. The best device to use for it is a laser combined with some electronic devices. And this is a, a really exciting area of research that people have won the Nobel Prize for recently. Uh, a guy by the name of Ted Hunch over in Germany did this for optical metrology, which is technically measuring things uh, using lasers. And we can talk more about applications of this if you're interested in class. Uh, so let's review. Uh, chapter 6, really briefly. Um, a laser cavity has several functions. It traps light rays so that the light gets fed back to the gain medium and amplified many times. It provides a feedback mechanism for laser operation. Uh, lasers generally do not work without some kind of feedback mechanism so this light gets trapped. It determines the Gaussian beam profile. This was chapter 5. And so it's going to say what the beam that comes out of the laser is going to look like and lets you do some engineering if you need a particular beam. And it also selects the longitudinal modes of the operating frequencies of the laser and essentially tells you how narrow the frequency output or what range of frequencies you're going to get out of the laser. And there's a lot more to laser design, but we're starting to see how the cavity plays a really critical role here.